Thank you very much, Mac, for inviting us onto the stage. And good morning, or good afternoon, sorry, everyone. For um, I hope you had a pleasant flight up here. We're going to talk to you today about the collaborative future of learning. And first, we're going to tell you our story. Simon and I met in grade five when Simon moved to our small suburban school in the southeastern suburbs of Melbourne. At first, we didn't talk much, but as we got to know each other, we realized we had a lot in common. And in year 11, by 2013, we went and we founded what was called the white band movement, a real radical way, um, a student-led way of reimagining education. We'd spend hours by the lake that we um, live by, you know, plotting and scheming to uh, sort of initialize this movement. But after a few failed attempts, we went back to the drawing board in the summer. And so with a passion for a new education system at the forefront of our minds, we went opportunity seeking. And pretty quickly we found possibly one of the best opportunities we possibly could have found was uh, called The Hub. Now, a hub is a co-working space. I don't know if anyone here knows what that is. If you do, please raise your hand. Wow, that's wow. actually really surprising. Okay, so for those who don't know, um, a co-working space is simply a shared office, and usually it's occupied by entrepreneurs, business people, uh, freelancers, creators, and people that run non-for-profits and uh, social, social enterprises as well. And because there's such a diverse range of people all working under one roof, um, ideation and collaboration really are a key component of the space and it occurs naturally. So as soon as we got there we were inundated with opportunities and people that were interested in what we had to say. So it was a great opportunity to turn ourselves from being idealistic dreamers into real entrepreneurs and so that was a great experience. But there was a little bit of a problem. According to the Hub, we were some of the youngest co-workers in Australia. At the time we were 16 and 17 and we did feel quite alone. But quickly, we started to attract a lot of young people with incredible self-direction. And um, we're going to share with you a few of those stories today about the learner's perspective. And the first one I want to tell you about is a bit close to myself. It's about a kid named Ben. Now, I met Ben at the National Youth Leaders Day, which was just held down by um, or near the Pearson HQ in Melbourne. And whenever I meet someone new like Ben, I ask them, what do they love to do? And I'll get to why that is later. So Ben... He uh, looked at me, and unfortunately, I think sometimes that I uh, don't expect much of kids in school anymore. When I dropped out, I thought, oh, wow, how could Ben really know what he loves to do? And he takes initiative in it. But anyway, Ben proved me wrong, and that was sort of a kickstart to this way of thinking. Ben told me that at 13 years old, he learned what kids in poverty had to go through, kids the same age as himself. He told me a specific story about a girl named Benedict from Thailand, 13 who would be forced into prostitution for a lack of education and community support. So he was listening to a motivational speaker one day, and no joke, at 13, he raced off home, and he went to print off as many copies as he could of, of a pamphlet for a new business he was creating, a dog walking business. This dog walking business, 100% of the proceeds would go to kids like Benedict. And so fast forward, we're back at the National Youth Leaders Day. He's 16, and he's raised over $20,000 through this business, which he now hires people for. Not only that, this picture down here is of the 40-hour famine being held at his school, which he led because he was um, known for being you know, very you know, progressive in that area. And I think they raised $60,000 that year at his school. Um, and I think that day he ran 116 kilometers over 40, 40 hours or something like that. Um, so he's very, very much passionate about that. But what topped it off, and I didn't realize that that's why he was backstage at the National Youth Leaders Day. He went up to get in front of a thousand other high school students and tell them to go forth and follow their passions and do what they love. And so when he got back down off stage, I went to him and said, man, Ben, you really are an inspiring guy. So you must know what you want to do when you grow up. Like you must have it 20 years planned out in the future. And he said, actually, I've got, I, I don't even know what I'm going to do past 18. All I know is what I want to do now, what I love, and that's to help other people. And that's why we ask people, what do they love to do? So we always say that our kids are our future. Because when they grow up, they're going to be the ones that dictate the world. They're going to be the ones that change the world. But how can that be true when there are so many young people out there already changing the world as we see it? And one of... Um most highly esteemed franchises that do it is, of course, the TED franchise. What they do is they give um, thousands of kids around the world that are doing amazing things a platform to basically share that. Actually, recently on their website, they uh, put up a blog post of just five of these videos that all shared something in common, and that was that there was five teenagers making huge innovations in um, curing cancer, essentially. I think this kid featured here, he um, created a new way of doing pancreatic tests that was, um, you know, 
a thousandth of the price of the traditional method. But we had to cherry pick a few of these stories and we've got two of them for you today. The first one is of Maya Penn. Maya Penn is from the US. Uh, she's an eco designer, she's an activist, a coder. She helps other entrepreneurs do what they love. But she's most noted for her eco design business called Maya's Ideas. Um, and it's changing the way the US industry looks at sustainability in fashion. The crazy thing is, she founded the company at eight years old and almost entirely by herself, which is quite a yeah, crazy feat. Um, but of course, what she demonstrates to us is that. Um, Age bracketing might not be the most important thing in education, that different kids at different ages have different abilities, and of course when you age bracket them, you might restrict what they can achieve. Um, and I know what you might be thinking now, well, so far you're talking about two kids in you know, two very privileged countries, they might be very intellectual, they're you know, outliers. But um, the second story, I want, or the third story I want to share with you is of Richard Churi. And he's from North Kenya. He lives in a remote um, village where they pretty much survive off cattle farming. His family have a cattle farm there. But the farm is on the border of the Nairobi um, National Park. And obviously what that means is that the lions, which are under um, conservation protection, often come and kill the cattle. And this presents a huge problem. So Richard would often at night have to um, protect these cattle and protect his family's well-being, essentially. And he was innovating with uh, electronics and lights and stuff like that into the night. This was between the ages of six and nine. And he, <laughs> crazy. And he came up with something called the Lion Light. And what it is, it's basically an electronic box that flashes lights at certain intervals and certain colors, and it gets put on the outside of the barn, flashing out, creating the illusion to the lions that there are people there guarding the cattle barn. Um, and funnily enough about Richard, so he's a demonstration that it's not just a rich, or rich, uh, a rich education that might you know, deliver you to success, it's more an environment that calls you to change and figure out how to innovate. But um, he was flying over to America, I think, to deliver this talk and that flight alone, I think he was only 10, changed his uh, goal now, he'd sort of solved the communal problem up where he was in North Kenya, but he actually decided, wait, now I want to be an, um, an air pilot and an air engineer. So. Quite incredible. Time magazine created a list of 25 of the most influential youth of last year. And we were lucky enough to meet number six on that list just by chance at a friend's gathering. His name's Eric Finman, and he dropped out of school at 15. And he was always told by uh, people at his school that he would never amount to anything. And I'm not being funny when I say that. He was sometimes literally told that. You know, he'd always get C's and D's. He wasn't academically smart. But Eric is the founder of a small startup called Botangle. And Botangle is really cool. It hooks up online tutors to students all over the world, no matter where they are or what they want to learn. Eric's now 16. He's moving down to Melbourne, actually, because he had such a great time with us. <laughs> and um, <laughs> he's on his way to making his first million at 16. So to me, he's a testament to the fact that you really do not to have academic smarts to be successful in creating the things that you're passionate about. So. These four stories here, they're incredible stories and they all demonstrate individual points or they um, sort of make implications about how the way education um, might possibly need to change. But what they show is that the next generation is already here. The next generation isn't this big thing sort of yet to come. They can already right now affect and influence change on the world. Actually, if it wasn't so, me and Simon wouldn't have been invited up here to talk today. So we're going to flip things around a little bit now. And we want to show you a video by a YouTuber by the name of CGP Grey. This video is called Humans Need Not Apply. And I hope, just prepare yourselves, because <laughs> this is a pretty startling image of the near future. So prepare yourself. <laughs> Enjoy. With almost no one needing to make food. Of course, it's not just farming. It's everything. We've spent the last several thousand years building tools to reduce physical labor of all kinds. These are mechanical muscles, stronger, more reliable, and more tireless than human muscles ever could be. Just as mechanical muscles made human labor less in demand, so are mechanical minds making human brain labor less in demand. This is an economic revolution. You may think we've been here before, but we haven't. This time is different. When you think of automation, you probably think of this. Giant, custom-built, expensive, efficient, but really dumb robots blind to the world and their own work. This is the new kind. 
Meet Baxter. Unlike these things, which require skilled operators and technicians and millions of dollars, Baxter has vision and can learn what you want him to do by watching you do it. And he costs less than the average annual salary of the human worker. Unlike his older brothers, he isn't pre-programmed for one specific job. He can do whatever work is within the reach of his arms. Baxter is what might be thought of as a general purpose robot, and general purpose is a big deal. Think computers. They too started out as highly custom and highly expensive, but when cheap-ish general purpose computers appeared, they quickly became vital to everything. Baxter today is the computer of the 1980s. He's not the apex, but the beginning. Even if Baxter is slow, his hourly cost is pennies worth of electricity, while his meat-based competition costs minimum wage. A tenth of the speed is still cost-effective when it's a hundredth the price. And while Baxter isn't as smart as some of the other things we will talk about, he's smart enough to take over many low-skilled jobs. And we've already seen how dumber robots than Baxter can replace jobs. Imagine a pair of horses in the early 1900s talking about technology. One worries all these new mechanical muscles will make horses unnecessary. The other reminds him that everything so far has made their lives easier. Remember all that farm work? Remember running from coast to coast delivering mail? Remember riding into battle? All terrible. These new city jobs are pretty cushy, and with so many humans in the city, there will be more jobs for horses than ever. Even if this car thingy takes off, you might say, there will be new jobs for horses we can't imagine. But you, dear viewer, from beyond 2000, know what happened. As mechanical muscles pushed horses out of the economy, mechanical minds will do the same to humans. Not immediately, not everywhere, but in large enough numbers and soon enough that it's going to be a huge problem if we're not prepared. And we're not prepared. Just as the car was the beginning of the end for the horse, so now does the car show us the shape of things to come. Self-driving cars aren't the future. They're here and they work. Self-driving cars have traveled hundreds of thousands of miles up and down the California coast and through cities, all without human intervention. The question is not if they'll replace cars, but how quickly. They don't need to be perfect, they just need to be better than us. Human drivers, by the way, kill 40,000 people a year with cars just in the United States. Given that self-driving cars don't blink, don't text while driving, don't get sleepy or stupid, it's easy to see them being better than humans because they already are. The transportation industry in the United States employs about 3 million people. Extrapolating worldwide, that's something like 70 million jobs at a minimum. These jobs are over. The autos are coming, and they're the first place where most people will really see the robots changing society. But there are many other places in the economy where the same thing is happening, just less visibly. So it goes with autos, so it goes for everything. It's easy to look at autos and Baxters and think technology has always gotten rid of low-skilled jobs we don't want people doing anyway. They'll get more skilled and do better educated jobs like they've always done. If your job is sitting in front of a screen and typing and clicking, like maybe you're supposed to be doing right now, the bots are coming for you too, buddy. Take the stock market, which in many ways is no longer a human endeavor. It's mostly bots that taught themselves to trade stocks, trading stocks with other bots that taught themselves. So bots have learned the market and bots have learned to write. If you've picked up a newspaper lately, you've probably already read a story written by a bot. There are companies that teach bots to write anything. Sports stories, TPS reports, even say those quarterly reports that you write at work. Paperwork, decision making, writing, a lot of human work falls into that category, and the demand for human mental labor in these areas is on the way down. But that's the simple stuff. IBM has a bot named Watson. Watson's day job is to be the best doctor in the world, to understand what people say in their own words and give back accurate diagnoses. He's already doing that at Sloan Kettering, giving guidance on lung cancer treatments. Just as autos don't need to be perfect, they just need to make fewer mistakes than humans, the same goes for doctor bots. Human doctors are by no means perfect. The frequency and severity of misdiagnoses are terrifying, and human doctors are severely limited in dealing with a human's complicated medical history. Doctor bots can learn from the experience of every doctor bot, can read the latest in medical research and keep track of everything that happens to all their patients worldwide and make correlations that would be impossible to find otherwise. Not all doctors will go away, but when the doctor bots are comparable to humans and they're only as far away as your phone, the need for general doctors will be less. So professionals, white collar workers, and low skill workers all have things to worry about from automation. But perhaps you are unfazed because you're a special creative snowflake. Well guess what? You're not that special. This music in the background that you're listening to, it was written by a bot. Her name is Emily Howell, and she can write an infinite amount of new music all day for free. And people can't tell the difference between her and human composers when put to a blind test. Talking about artificial creativity gets weird fast. What does that even mean? But nonetheless, it's a developing field. People used to think that playing chess was a uniquely creative human skill that machines could never do, right up until the point they'd be the best of us. And so it will go for all human talents. Right. This may have been a lot to take in, and you might want to reject it. It's important to emphasize again that this stuff isn't science fiction. The robots are here right now. There is a terrifying amount of working automation in labs and warehouses around the world. We have been through economic revolutions before, but the robot revolution is different. 
Horses aren't unemployed now because they got lazy as a species. They're unemployable. There's little work that a horse can do to pay for its housing and hay. And many bright, perfectly capable humans will find themselves the new horse, unemployable through no fault of their own. Here's the list of jobs ranked by the number of people who perform them. It's a sobering list with the transportation industry at the top. Continuing downward, all of this work existed in some form a hundred years ago, and almost all of them are easy targets for automation. Only when we get to number 33 on the list is there finally something new. The unemployment rate during the Great Depression was 25%. The list above is 45% of the workforce. Just what we've talked about today, the stuff that already works, can push us over that number pretty soon. We need to start thinking now about what to do when large sections of the population are unemployable through no fault of their own. What to do in a future where, for most jobs, humans need not apply. I think we, uh, CPG Gray deserves a round of applause. What do you think? Now, as you may have noticed, there were some editing blips and that, thanks to myself, because that's actually a really short version of it. There's a lot more scary stuff that he talks about in the full video, so I highly encourage you to uh, just look up humans, need not apply on Google, and watch the whole thing to get, you know, more scared. Um, so what we tried to show you in that video, that change is coming. And it's coming far hard, and it's coming fast. And it's very hard to predict. But we have to be agile and willing to let go of the past if we want to keep up with it. But me and Remy, we're not done yet. There's still more to consider. <laughs> so we've been talking a bit about, or the video shows a bit about automation, but there are some radical technologies coming along the way that also will change the way the global ecosystem works. And don't worry, we're not just scaring you for the sake of it. There is a point. So um, a lot of powerful companies like Google are very, um, or they're pursuing what well, is called genetic immortality. Um, at Calico Labs, they're using a technique planarian worms use to infinitely replicate stem cells without damage to essentially increase the human lifespan by um, degrees we don't even know yet. And in the south of France, they're building um, the ITA fusion reactor. It's a joint uh, government initiative where essentially what they're trying to do is build a sun on the planet. No joke, it's 25 meters in di diameter, but it's about 10 times hotter than the center of our sun. And from a private perspective, Lockheed Martin is looking at putting a variant of one of these reactors into the back of a plane, um, essentially creating infinite flight around the globe. So kids that enter the school system today, you know, kindergarten, prep and that, they're going to graduate their tradition, from their traditional education in a time where most, if not all, or, uh, monotonous jobs have been automated. It'll be a time where people are living longer than they ever have before in human history. And it'll be a time where we not only have an abundance of electricity, as we just tried to show you then, but we also wanted to talk about you know, having an abundance of food, an abundance of manufactured goods, even abundance of wealth. But we'd love to talk about that, but unfortunately we could ramble on forever and never stop, but we won't go put you through that. But what we have to consider is, is that if this is just around the corner, if this sort of stuff is just 10 or 15 years away, we really have to have a hard think about where a traditional education fits into it all. Because the scary thing is, you can do a university degree almost anywhere in the world now, and you can take it to any organisation around the world to do a particular task or play a particular role. Doesn't that sound like computer software? Isn't that exactly what computer software sounds like? You know, I, I could sign up to do a marketing degree, right? A market, and I specialize in marketing analysis. And then I can go to some other organization in some other country and say, hi, my name's Simon. I'm programmed to do marketing analysis. And I'd be more or less on the money. But the problem is, is I wouldn't be getting the money because s someone will pay a software company to get a marketing analysis bot on a computer that costs a tiny fraction of what it would cost to have me, Simon, the marketing analysis dude, working for you. And they're getting better than humans are now, so it's really scary. And for me personally, I did that to just sort of, you know, shake up anyone who's in marketing in this room. <laughs> but for me personally, this is happening as well. Um, I taught myself how to build websites about two years ago, and I've been doing it professionally for a year now. But unfortunately, that's coming to a very quick end because there is a piece of software coming out not in 10 years time, but next, at the end of this year actually, that will pretty much replace my job. It's called the grid. And what it is, is a piece of software that you give it text, you give it images, you, get it video, you give it videos, and then it will just build a completely unique website for you. And then you can say, I like it, but I was looking for something a bit more professional. And it will take 
that information and rebuild it again. And it will not only take in that information, it will take in what your objective is, whether you're after more subscribers or more followers or more views or more sales, whatever it is, it will build your website around that. And if you took it and put Simon into, that, into those sentences, that's pretty much what I would do as a job. So it's over. And we have to think, you know, if I had spent tens of thousands of dollars at a university and three to four years of my life doing that, what's that worth? Traditional education, we need to have a hard think about where it fits in. So we didn't, yeah, just say all of this to scare you because we believe that it's very important. And that's why we started off with the learner perspective because I think that's where we can learn the most. What do learners actually want? How do they learn better? What do they respond well to? But it's very important to also consider the global perspective because all these changes are going to come and essentially change the need for global education because our work, our lifestyles, health, resource distribution, conflict resolution, all of these things are intrinsically linked to education. And what me and Remy would say is next. What's after a traditional education system? It's an education that supports independence and individualism. We can actually talk about this in the context of the original root of the word education. Does anyone know what it is, just out of interest? No. That's funny. Because <laughs> the root of the word education comes from the Latin word educa, which means to draw from within. There are a few other translations. They all roughly mean the same thing, but that's the one that resonates with me the most to draw from within. And so that is exactly what we are talking about when we are talking about an independent education. To draw within yourself what it is that you learn. So a more independent education, but also what that implies is potentially a more uh, or less expensive education. We're seeing, I'm sure you guys have heard about Khan Academy and those sort of startups. Um, we're getting this infinite uh, distribution and uh, digestibility of content, what that means is that education might not need to get more expensive or more resource orientated because we want learners that can cherry pick that content by themselves and use it. So that brings us to our idea. And our idea, thankfully, has brought us to this stage. We think it's a step in the right direction, not to address all of these issues, but for a lot of people, it could be a good solution and a good way of going about dealing with such radical changes within the next decade or two. And so we call it, well, actually, first I'm going to tell you a little bit story about when we started to talk about this vision back down in Melbourne. Um, yeah, we were 16 at 17 at the time. And a lot of the time in Hub, you, if you, any of you have been at the Hub, you know what they're like. They're very enthusiastic. So, you know, we're, we need to talk to a new group of people and they say, hey, look, guys, here's, you know, the two kids that want to revolutionize education. You know, it's a bit of a burden to bear. And um, <laughs> straight away, people would have, like, these preconceptions. Maybe they'd, like, design the most complex and awesome, you know, learning management system that we've ever seen of at home in their garage or something like that. But what we wanted was something actually quite simple. We didn't, we want, we didn't want to build a new system because we know that systems, if they're not regulated correctly, do get old, you know, five to ten years later. We wanted something that could adapt very easily to the learner perspective, what the learners wanted, and also adapt to or reflect what the real world is going through because this is where the learners are going to exit. And we call that's an environment, the collaborative learning environment. But it's sort of taken on the name of a co-learning space because it's more simple and I think it relates back to co-working a lot. In our minds, anything is a co-working space when it represents three simple principles and I'm going to list those principles. So number one, as we've already touched on, anyone can learn anything anywhere. There are no knowledge restrictions anymore. If you want to know something, there are easy and cheap ways to find out about it. Number two, in order to learn anything though, you need to have the self-direction and motivation, not only to just learn about stuff, because you can learn about stuff and do nothing with it, but you need to have the self-direction and the motivation to create stuff with it, to have something for show for it, not only for yourself, but for the rest of the world as well. And number three, in order to be self-directed, you need to have people around you who support you and your ideas. And so the third and final principle is collaboration. And anyway, any space can be a co-learning space potentially. You know, it could be in a warehouse, an old derelict warehouse, or it could be in a school, or a university, or a hall, or an office. We've been running our pilot programs out of co-working spaces like the Hub for the last couple of months now. Anywhere that there is space, there can be a co-learning space. So these are the principles that sort of um, 
there's many co-learning spaces around the world that fit this description. Just like before, co-working spaces were a thing. There were definitely places in which co-working occurred. And co-working now is built on four very strong principles or foundations. But we want to get practical now because that's how we find we best explain the idea. So at the moment, there's a current space in every single community or almost every community in Victoria that's supposed to act like this, a place where knowledge is accessed, knowledge is shared, people can collaborate and work together. And of course, we're talking about the library. Now, can I have a show of hands? Who still has a library card? Oh. Okay, that's a Actually, lot. no, that was a complete oversight bus. We just approached a publishing company thinking yeah. that no one would have a library card. Yeah. Okay, great. We were, we were talking earlier with someone about how they asked that question at another conference and you know maybe 5% of people put up their hands, so I don't know if that's a bit of an introspective thing you guys can take into a perspective. Anyway. <laughs> Let's just pretend... Well, let's not pretend. Let's imagine... No, sorry. What's a word for imagine? You guys go to the library, right? You should know about this. <laughs> What's a word for imagine that's like you actually believe it's happening, but it's really not? Okay. Our belief. We believe in it. <laughs> I'm just going to pretend that this is actually happening. So in the State Library of Victoria, they have a large wing on the western wing that they want to renovate. And we suggested to them that they make a co-learning space out of it. And we told them the first thing that we would do as the co-learners is we would consider the space around the library that already exists. So the State Library of Victoria is smack bang pretty much in the middle of the Melbourne CBD. So we have to consider what's around us. We've got three universities, we've got about 10 to 15 high schools within easy reach, and about five other learning institutions all very close to the space. And within each of those there's about 100 to tens of thousands of young people in them already trying to learn stuff and get out in the world. But what else is in them? They've got advanced resources already. They've got all the labs, all the classrooms, all the lecture theatres. They've got all of the artistic spaces. They've got all the design spaces. We don't need to do any of that stuff. We really do not need to reinvent the wheel. So now what's left? What, what, what's missing from this picture? And in our mind, it's simply two things. One, facilitation to support self-directed learners. Does anyone know of a space in Melbourne that actually does that well? No, exactly. Number two, collaboration. A place where people can come together to further their own projects and their own ideas and their own dreams with each other. So that's what this space will provide, we think. So we're going to run quickly through the process because just like the three, three principles, we, um, we've simplified a lot. It's definitely not like a you know, 214 booklet on the curriculum or anything like that. It's actually just a very poorly made slide. <laughs> um, the first step is facilitation. So you come into this space as a learner, just imagine you're any sort of learner and you, there's nothing to say after 18 or 23 or something, you're, not, you're no longer a learner anymore. Everyone is indeed a learner. And th this space is very different to the one you used to. There's no timetable, there's no bell anymore. Um, there's literally no rules in the traditional sense. So the first thing to do is figure out, okay, what am I going to do? And that's yeah, where the facilitation comes in. And facilitation has become a huge industry now. I'm sure you guys are very much aware of that, have had a lot of facilitation happening within um, your organization. And basically what this is for the learner is for them to turn their interests into things they want to do. And what this thing you want to do, we call a project. And the co-learning space truly lives and breathes project. This is a great way of describing what you do. It's actual work. It's actual real world work that makes potentially a huge impact into the way other people live their lives. It's something to show for what you do. And so the objective after facilitation is to get yourself a project or get yourself several projects involved with other people. And finally, and we've been running a few of these in our test space, you know, kids get together their projects and what they want to do. Maybe they want to um, get better at photography, writing, maybe they're into app development or something like that. What's most important then is connection, um, uh, potentially connection to resources, but what we really believe is the most valuable connection is collaboration. And that's sort of the influence that we got from co-working spaces, where that is basically the lifeblood we bring in people from the surrounding area that already exists in to support the learners in what they want to do. So say you're a kid and you want to learn more about coding. Well, there's a lot of startups in and around the city and near the state library. We can bring in developers there to help you. Um, just say you want to learn more about photography. There are a lot of meetups in the area that can support you there. Or 
perhaps even writing. There are a lot of meetups in and around Melbourne and ones that would be held in the space itself that can help you with that. So that's it. <laughs> Three principles. This short process here. <laughs> that's a co-learning space. What do you think? Do you think we got it right? What do you think's missing? We've already been working pretty hard back down in Melbourne to try and get some stuff started. We've been getting a bit of traction, but that's not where our vision ends. So our vision is that we're seeing all this massive change around the world. Every day in developing countries, more and more and more people are getting hooked up to the internet. And with all these startups and that around content um, being easily di di digested, I know Pearson's doing a lot in that area around efficacy and actually looking at the outputs. What that means is we're almost going through a second renaissance, um, like relative to you know, what the 21st century is. And we've got all this digital learning going on. What we saw is missing was a physical space where that can be honed in. People actually meet up, turn that digital learning into real world outcomes. And so that's the grand vision of um, co-learning. And where that leaves us, funnily enough, is you guys, Pearson. So, um, when we were invited to give this presentation, we were um, absolutely, obviously, at 17 and 18, very much amazed because you guys are the largest learning organization on the planet. Um, you guys, on paper, have the greatest ability to change um, what's going out there. You have the people, the resources, the experience, the connection. Yeah, you guys are amazing. I don't know how else to put that. <laughs> <laughs> So we understand that the theme of this conference is around growth, but how do you want to grow? I want to take you to a place where growth is a necessary part of survival. as a rainforest, and the objective of every plant in a rainforest is to get as much of that precious sunlight as it possibly can. And in order to do that, it has to grow in a couple of ways. I like to think of Pearson as a big old tree. It's been here a long time, but you're not the only plant in the forest. Don't, don't get carried away. There's lots of ferns and shrubs and all that below you, but there's also new trees sprouting every day, and there's trees all over the rainforest. That's what makes it a rainforest, right? So to keep your position as a big old tree, you need to, do, you need to grow in two ways. First of all, you need to grow up. You've been doing that for 180 years now, or thereabouts. So that's quite an effort. But you also need to grow out. And by that, I somewhat mean literally branching out. Branching out into new ideas and seeing the future with an intention to understand it and to delve into those new ideas that are such an important part of it. And a uh, quick note, when Mac uh, told us that there would be uh, tree sort of growth banners around here, we were very much happy we felt like you know, it was a sign. But to further, <laughs> to further analogy um, along, that big old tree supports the most life in the forest, doesn't it? It has you know, monkeys and birds and fungi, it supports a lot of these things. But outside the analogy, obviously what we're referring to are new ideas, new projects, interesting ways of looking at it. And just like mutual symbiosis works in the forest, um, we urge you to feed into those ideas so you can yourselves grow outwards. Because this... Uh, ecosystem, this rainforest ecosystem, when it changes, it provides organisms inside it with both a necessity to grow, but most importantly, or change, but most importantly, it's an incentive. So you guys are living in a global ecosystem that's giving you an incentive. It's saying, come on, let's change. And if things are changing, let's grow and make this a better place. So we're very excited to uh, sort of have come up here as a keynote today. And basically kick off a conference where the largest learning organization in the world is wanting to continue to grow. Thank you very much.